The Best Christmas Present in the World by Michael Morpurgo. I spotted it in a junk shop in Bridport, a roll top desk. The man said it was early 19th century and oak. I had been looking for a desk like this for years, but never found one. I could afford. This was in bad condition, the roll top in several pieces, one leg clumsily mended, scorch marks all down one side. It was going for very little money, and I reckoned I was just about capable enough to have a go at restoring it. It would be a risk, a challenge, but here was my chance to have a roll top desk at last. I paid the man and brought it back to my workroom at the back of the garage. I began to work on it on Christmas Eve, mostly because the house was resonating with overexcited relatives and I wanted some peace and quiet. I removed the roll up completely and pulled out the drawers. Each one of them confirmed that this would be a bigger job than I had first thought. The veneer had lifted almost everywhere. It looked like flood damage, both fire and water had clearly taken their toll on this desk. The last drawer was stuck fast. I tried all I could to ease it out gently. In the end, I used brutal force. I struck it sharply with the side of my fist and the drawer flew open to reveal a shallow space underneath, a secret drawer. There was something in there. I reached in and took out a small black tin box. Taped to the top of it was a piece of lined notepaper and written on it in shaky handwriting, Jim's last letter, received the 25th of January, 1915, to be burned with me when the time comes. I knew as I did it that it was wrong of me to open the box, but curiosity got the better of my scruples. It usually does. Inside the box, there was an envelope. The address read, Mrs. Jim MacPherson, 12 Copper Beaches, Bridport, Dorset. I took out the letter and unfolded it. It was written in pencil and dated at the top, the 26th of December, 1914. Boxing Day. Dearest Connie, I write to you in a much happier frame of mind because something wonderful has just happened that I must tell you about at once. We were all standing too in our trenches yesterday morning, Christmas morning. It was crisp and quiet all about as beautiful a morning as I've ever seen, as cold and frosty as a Christmas morning should be. I should like to be able to tell you that we begin it, began it, but the truth, I'm ashamed to say, is that Fritz began it. First someone saw a white flag waving from the trenches opposite. Then they were calling out to us from across no man's land. Happy Christmas, Tommy! Happy Christmas! When we had got over the surprise, some of us shouted back, same to you, Fritz. Same to you. I thought that would be that. We all did. But then suddenly, one of them was up, there in the grey great coat and waving a white flag. Don't shoot, lads, someone shouted, and no one did. Then there was another, Fritz, up, on the parapet, and another. Keep your heads down, I told the men. It's a trick. But it wasn't. One of the Germans was waving a bottle above his head. It is Christmas Day, Tommy. We have schnapps. We have sausage. We meet you, yes? By this time, there were dozens of them walking towards us across no man's land and not a rifle between them. Little Private Morris was the first up. Come on, boys. What are we waiting for? And then there was no stopping them. I was the officer. I should have called a halt to it there and then, I suppose. But the truth is that it never occurred to me all along their line and ours I could see men walking towards one another, grey coats, khaki coats, meeting in the middle, and I was one of them. I was part of this, in the middle of the war, we were making peace. You cannot imagine, dearest Connie, my feelings as I looked into the eyes of the Fritz officer who approached me, hand outstretched. Hans Wolf, he said, gripping my hand warmly and holding it. I am from Dusseldorf. I play the cello in the orchestra. Happy Christmas. Captain Jim MacPherson, I replied, and a happy Christmas to you too. I'm a school teacher from Dorset, in the west of England. Ah, Dorset, he smiled. I know the place. I know it very well. We shared my rum ration and his excellent sausage, and we talked. Connie, how we talked. He spoke almost perfect English, but it turned out that he had never set foot in Dorset. 
He had learned all he knew of England from school and from reading books in English. His favourite writer was Thomas Hardy, his favourite book, Far From the Madding Crowd. So out there, in no man's land, we cut talks of Bathsheba and great Gabriel Oak and Sergeant Troy and Dorset. He had a wife and one son, born just six months ago. As I looked about me, there were huddles of khaki and grey everywhere, all over, no man's land, smoking, laughing, talking, drinking, eating. Hans Wolf and I shared what was left of our wonderful Christmas cake. He thought the marzipan was the best he had ever tasted. I agreed. We agreed about everything, Connie, and he was my enemy. There never was a Christmas party like it, Connie. Then someone, I didn't know, who brought on a football. Great coats were dumped in piles to make goalposts. And the next thing we knew, it was Tommy against Fritz, out in the middle of no man's land. Hans Wolf and I looked on and cheered, clapping our hands and stamping our feet. To keep out the cold as much as anything, there was a moment when I noticed our breaths mingling in the air between us. He saw it too and smiled. Jim McPherson, he said after a while, I think this is how we should resolve this war. A football match. No one dies.